What is going on guys? Jack here and welcome back to episode number 30 of Park to Prem here with Nottingham Forest. Today it is the start of season number 11 and we have the Community Shield against who else? It's Chelsea, the winners of the Premier League. Of course a team who we butted heads with a lot last season. I envisage it's going to be more of the same this year but of course with it being a new season, a new dawn and a new day... There's transfers and stuff to talk about before we get to that match. And well, the first thing of note is I'm not Liverpool manager everyone. Yes, at the end of yesterday's episode, I kind of discussed the fact that there was a possibility we might be moving on. Um, I did apply for the job. I did have an interview and then they gave it to Stephen Gerrard out of pure favouritism. So not, not a massive fan of that. I mean, from a personal perspective, I would have liked the ego boost of Liverpool offering me the job ahead of Stephen Gerrard. Not sure I would have taken it either way, but that's happened. And well, the other big thing that's happened over the summer, of course, is transfers and job offers because the World Cup happened, everyone. Yes, it was a World Cup summer and off the back of it, England won a World Cup 2030. It was in England. It was won by England at Wembley. Brings a tear to my eye imagining it. Um, we had actually had 13 players called up to the national teams uh, for the World Cup, which was really cool. And we actually had a player called up for the England squad. He didn't actually play, but Owen Ricketts was included in the squad. So all three of our midfielders called up for England. It was kind of a bit neat. And well, off the back of the World Cup, a few teams didn't perform so well. And we did have job offers from Spain, Italy and the Netherlands. In the end, I just declined them all. I'm not really about that international management life. I don't mind doing it once or twice when it's like big tournaments upcoming. But to be honest, I find a lot of it kind of boring, all the in-between bits. If I'm managing a bigger nation, you know, you kind of live for the big cups every couple of years. And if you're a smaller nation, I feel like it kind of takes over the club football stuff and becomes just a bit of a distraction and I struggle to manage both. I would love to know down in the comments, do you do international management in Football Manager? Is it just me who finds it really awkward and a bit kind of time consuming if I'm also managing a club? I'd love to know your thoughts down below. Anyway, let's talk about what's been going on in terms of transfers because we've been busy, everyone, and busy making sales. Oh, the, 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 the comment section is not going to be kind to me, I fear, today. I have sold £115 million worth of players and the most expensive sale... It's Samake to Beijing, and in fact, I've sold three players to Beijing. Samake's gone for 37.5 million. He got some big goals for us last year, but in the league, he just wasn't good enough. And so when I got offered 37.5 million, it became difficult to turn it down. And then actually, on the same day, they bid on Akamash, two players who I discussed letting go last episode, and Beijing wanted them both. So I let them sign both for a combined 74 million pounds. I mean, they're good. They're not £74 million good. And also, they came in for another player, Beijing. So thank you very much. They're our feeder club at this point. We're just going to give them players. Uh, they took Mateus Fernandes off my hands for £10 million, which for a 32-year-old centre mid, who we signed for £11 million, I think actually is quite a good bit of business, considering he played three games for us last year. Elsewhere on the sales, we did have a few fairly big names leave us. Bermendez, I've ended up letting go back to Mexico. This guy at 20 years old looked like he had a load of potential when he joined us for 600k. Didn't really work out. A couple of loan spells later, we're selling him back to Mexico for 10 million pounds. It's a load of profit made at the end of the day. So whilst it's disappointing he hasn't quite made it, it's plenty of cash. Another player not dissimilar, I suppose, in position is Steve Chalaber. You may remember we signed him from Manchester City for 1.5 million back when we were in the championship. He had a good year on loan at Southampton last year, but ultimately 10 million pounds was just a lot of money for a player sat in the reserves. And finally, one more 10 million pound sale, Leighton Stewart. Um, he never really lived up to my hopes and expectations and my dreams. Uh, last year, he was on loan at Newcastle, where he played infrequently in the Championship. Sadly, I just don't think he's quite a Premier League quality player. The good news is for us, he was part of our promotion-winning season. He got plenty of goals then. We managed to sell him on for not too much of a loss. But disappointing that we couldn't forge more memories with Leighton Stewart, I suppose. So anyway, those are the transfers in terms of the big outs, a couple of other players going out on loan that you may recognise. And in terms of the ins, we've not spent too much money. Uh, the first player we've got is Matteo Saligia. 
Celia, I might just call him a Matty, might be easier. Um, this guy is a really, really good centre mid. He's 21 years old, Croatian international, but he can also play left back. And actually, I see left back being a position I end up playing him in quite a lot. He's really good there. Needed a little bit of squad depth at left wing back. The fact he can play centre mid is great. You can see here, Juve signed him for £31 million a few years ago. He played regular football in Serie A, make no mistake. His average rating's not too impressive, but for £10 million, great little squad option to add to to the team uh, and then we come on to a few youngsters the first that we've got is German Starico who I'm I'm certain is going to be a little star uh, he's gone straight on loan to Hearts over in Scotland but he's a really good centre-back 18 years old um, really good mentals really good aerial ability great defensively not the quickest defender in the world but I think he's really going to flourish and he is in my opinion comfortably a player good enough to play in the Scottish Premier League for the season we then have Fabio Torres, who's joined us from Swansea City. He's only 15 years old, but loads of potential. Signed him for less than a million pounds. He might be one of those transfers that we look back on and go, that was an insane bargain, or we look back on as we're releasing him age 23 and he's just not improved. Hopefully... It's going to be the former rather than the latter. Anyway, we then have a couple of players who we agreed to sign already, but they've now officially joined us. Casanova, uh, the Uruguayan under-21 international, joins us. A really, really good left-back. Not incredible going forward, but for an 18-year-old, he looks solid. Maybe a few question marks over his potential, but he was a free transfer. Worst case scenario, we make a load of money off him, a bit like the uh, the Bun Mundes sale that we had back to Mexico. And finally, a player who I've been eagerly anticipating, Stefan Hahn, joins us from Augsburg. He was playing in the Bundesliga last year, made his debut for the Austria national team. Three goals in two caps, pretty good goal scoring return early on. And at 18 years old, he looks absolutely phenomenal, hoping he's going to live up to his potential. So anyway, those are the transfers. Or are they? Because you might notice that the spend the, sp the spend for last season is a lot bigger than when I left things last time. Because at the start of the transfer window, knowing that Samake and Ash Akamash were going out, I needed to get in a new player. A secret weapon. And I found that player for £55 million. And his name is Van Dijk. It's not the Van Dijk you're thinking it is before you get too concerned. It is Wouter Van Dijk, who is a Dutch 24-year-old winger. He's got loads of caps and loads of goals for the Dutch national team. And my, oh my, he looks absolutely phenomenal. We've signed him from AZ Alkmaar. You can see for them, he has just been their standout player for a number of years, uh, kind of tearing up the Eredivisie. He joins us now in the Premier League. He's a natural striker. We're going to be playing him out on the left as an inside forward. And oh my word, he ticks all the boxes and then some. So very excited to have this guy join us. He has been the big, big transfer I've made so far. Of course, even with that deal, you look at the money that we've actually made from sales this year. Um, you know, £55 million spent on top of the £18 million. What does that take us to? £73 million spent. So you might think, oh, there's still £40 million in the bank. There absolutely is. There's £60 million in the bank. And I am looking at a few other players to join us before the actual start of the season. If we just have a look here uh, at the players on the ends who I'm looking at, I'm looking at a centre-back, everyone. I feel like getting in a world-class centre-back is kind of one of the few areas of the pitch where we can really look to grow. And I've got three players here, and I've made bids for them all, and I've negotiated with them all, and I could sign whichever one I want, but I'm not sure. They all have issues, and the issue is every single one of them is inconsistent. Now, the first we've got is Tvetskov. Which just sounds like a rip-off of Shvetsov, doesn't it, from last year's Park to Prem. This guy is a Bulgarian centre-back, currently playing for Ludogorets. Look, looks absolutely great in terms of current ability. Really good with the ball at his feet. He's available for 3.6 million. So, although he's not likely to get a work permit, although he's not consistent, I may end up signing this guy anyway as a little bit of a punt for the price that he commands. But he's a really good passing centre-back. The two other options, though, two players who could definitely slot into the first team. The first we have here is Coroao, who is a Italian centre-back. He plays for Sampdoria, 20 years old, 14 caps for the Italian under-21s team. He looks really good, but again, lacks natural fitness. He's inconsistent, very one-footed. A few negatives in there, although he is labelled as a wonder kid. The other option we have, and the player who I think I'm most likely to sign, is Paulo Silva from Benfica. This guy is considered Benfica's key player. He's 22 years old. He's a Portuguese international. We have agreed to sign him for a possible £48 million, which is not a small amount of money, but he does look absolutely great. Lacking a little bit in the mentals department, maybe not too adaptable, 
um, and a little inconsistent. But he likes big matches. His physicals are top draw, and I am I'm I'm slowly but surely convincing myself he might be the man to sign. He looks absolutely great, playing close to his full potential. So he might not improve a great deal, but I feel like as far as centre backs go, compare him to Peter Shack, he would be a really really good addition to the team who would take us up a level. Of course, we're in the Champions League this year. We are, you know, taking a big leap forward. I want to be a team making regular Champions League football from here on out. Our media prediction of eighth clearly represents the fact that the media don't think that we have the quality to do that. I back us to do it just based off what I saw last season. We've not sold too many players. We've added a bit of strength in depth. You can see here, just looking at the season preview, we're a long way down the pecking order. We're not the most favourite of teams. And in fact, in terms of key players, Van Dijk and Erk are considered our two play key players in the team. You may have spotted as well with Van Dijk, the wage spend has gone up this year. Um, in Football Manager, I'm always very hesitant to start offering players big wage rises because what happens is a player of a similar squad status looks across the dressing room and goes, hang on a minute, that guy's on twice as much as me. I want more money. And that's how you can get into this endless spiral in Football Manager of players asking for larger and larger wages that you just can't afford. But... We're a Champions League team now. We have to, at some point, start offering players £100,000 a week. So I've done that with Van Dyke. Roger came to me and was like, hey, Gaffer, contract's expiring kind of soon. Can I have a new deal? He's so good for us at right back. I've given him that new deal, of course. There was big interest from Lazio last season um, where they bid £60 million for him. I think now that you look at his value of £58 million, I think it was the right decision not to sell him. I think he's the kind of player who we could get bigger offers for. But you can just see here across the board, the wages are slowly creeping up. And whilst even if I sign silver, there would be some transfer budget remaining, um, there's a real possibility I might just have to shuffle some of it into the wage budget just to balance out the books. But the good news is just looking at the first team, we have no players with contracts expiring at the end of this season and only a handful expiring at the end of next year. So for the most part, I feel like the core of the team is locked down for the long term future. I look across the dressing room and I think this is a team capable of playing in the Champions League. And we should be good to go. Now, one thing you'll notice here, and I talked about it last episode, is tactical shifts this year. Um, I want to mix things up. I want to get Lind into the starting eleven because I feel like he's good enough to start playing for us. And in order to facilitate that, I've uh, ditched the centre defensive mid in favour of a centre mid who sits between, obviously, two slightly more offensive centre mids. I do feel like between Ricketts, Lind and Smith, I've kind of got the England conundrum of 15 years ago where I've got a Lampard, I've got a Gerrard and I've got a Scholes. And I've somehow got to get all three of them functioning in the midfield. I think that this is the best way to make it happen. Now, it looks quite different to what we played last year. In reality, it's not a world away. Um, you will notice that in terms of the wing-backs, I've now got them set to complete wing-back. I want them to stick in a little wider. Um, whilst they are going to get forward, I want them to stitch up the play with the midfield a little more rather than mindlessly looking for the overlap because, well, we've got an extra man in midfield and additionally, we are without that defensive centre mid now with Lind moving slightly higher up. We'll see if it works. If this completely backfires, I can easily revert back. But I feel like with Rickich, you've got an absolutely top quality advanced playmaker. I can't really play him as a deep line playmaker because of his player traits. Um, stuff like getting into the opposition area, wanting to play one twos. Um, in fact, he has a lot of traits, doesn't he? Does Ricketts. And he, he just likes to run with the ball often. Basically, it, it will prohibit him from ever being a deep line playmaker. Lind, on the other hand, whilst he's not the best defensively, he's absolutely insane from a passing perspective. He's got great passing, great technique, his vision and work rate work. For a deep line playmaker, as I said, defensively, maybe a few questions, but I think on the whole, he's a really good player. And he's not someone who's got the craziest acceleration to get up and down the pitch. And of course, to the right, we've got Smith, who's going to play as a Mazala, which I think he's really well suited to. He has got that, you know, physicality to his game to play this kind of role. Again, a great player with the ball at his feet. Not as creative in terms of, um, you know, an out-and-out -out playmaker by any means, but just a super well-rounded centre mid who... Uh, I'm hoping is going to be a bit of an engine amongst two other creative players in the centre of the midfield. We'll have to see how he gets on over the course of this year. You can see Van Dijk's going to go out and play on the left. It's a bit annoying, really, but he can't play on the right-hand side. Um, he could play as a striker, potentially, if Amlo struggles for form. Maybe we start playing him up front. means that Erk is this year going to be playing out on the right-hand side. 
much like I was saying throughout last year, over the summer, he's continued to develop. He looks absolutely superb. Someone I don't want to deprive first team opportunities to. Of course, Amlo up front. That does mean that this year, Steve Secker is going to be on the bench a little bit more. Of course, he had his issues with injuries last year. Um, he's a great player, don't get me wrong, but that injury has left me a little bit concerned. And I feel like with Erk and with Van Dyke, we've got two players who are probably slightly higher up in the pecking order. That said, Steve Secker, in terms of impact subs, uh, I don't think we could ever get a much better player in terms of quality than him. And I'm sure this year he will get starts. He will get time. We're going to have to rotate the team much like we did last year. Anyway, looking at the rest of the team, I mean, you can see the starting 11 here. Not a great deal has changed, of course, with Lind coming into midfield. Sun Sao is on the bench this year. We've got Dr. Medge and Marcelo, two other young options with tons of potential. We've then got Matty, who, of course, is going to be able to play left back as well as a mo more mobile centre mid role for us on the bench. Juan Ho Hernandez, not a dissimilar player, really. Slightly more creative. It's quite nice. I feel like uh, Hernandez here can play the deep line playmaker or the advanced playmaker role in our three man midfield. Whereas in Matty, we've got someone who can play that Mazala role as well as the left back position. So that works out quite nicely. And that does mean that, of course, on the bench, Demani Grimes is also just chilling here. Anyway, it's the first game of the season. We are taking on Chelsea. It's the Community Shield. And I feel a need to just show you the fact that they spent £220 million on a player at the end of the season last season. They've signed this guy. Now, they've, he's injured. They've, he's injured for 10, uh, 11 days to three weeks. They've signed him for £220 million, which, don't get me wrong, he looks good, but I'm just going to compare him to Van Dyke here. That's, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to compare him to Van Dyke and leave it. One of these players was signed for £55 million, The other was signed for £220 and whilst, you know what, Lazar probably is a tiny bit better because of his technicals, I, I know which player I would rather have. And I think it highlights, actually, the quality that Van Dyke brings to our team. I'm really shocked that he hasn't got a move sooner away from AZ Alkmaar. Because, um, frankly, he's too good to be playing for AZ Alkmaar. I expect one of the big um, kind of teams to come in for him. I actually had an eye on him last year, but I just couldn't justify spending the kind of money they wanted on him. Either way, let's get into this finally. It is Chelsea. It's a return to Wembley. We've been here before, everyone. It's the third time in 12 months that we're at Wembley playing Chelsea. And I believe it is still Frank Lampard's Chelsea. Hopefully, we're going to dispatch of them like we did last time we met in the FA Cup semi-final. And get the win here, of course. They won the league. We won the FA Cup. That is how we're here. This is the traditional start to the English season. Um, it's worth noting, actually, that next uh, episode, I think we're going to do a triple header. Our first three league games of the season are against Chelsea, Liverpool and Arsenal. They're not in that order, but it's those three games. Um, I think those are three really interesting tests to start the season, which will probably set the tone for how our season goes. Last year... Our league season started so well. It was a massive reason for our success. It's going to be very tough to replicate that. But next episode, it'll be a good test of whether or not that can really happen. Anyway, let's see how we get on with this new system in play. Of course, Lind playing as the deep line playmaker. I feel like the deep line playmaker within our system, I say our system, within the previous system, never really you know, had the craziest average ratings, never really contributed much. I do wonder if just shifting that player forward might help us out a little bit. Also, it's our nemesis, everyone. Connor Smith, he's playing for them. Of course he blooming. Look how good he is. Look how blooming. I mean, I don't like him, but he is on the pitch for Chelsea. I am very scared. You may have also caught the fact that for those of you really anal about the squad numbers being correct, for the most part, I've given players their correct numbers now. I say correct. I'm like doing brackets with my fingers. For the purists out there, as we have a chance, oh my word, Peter Shack just puts it wide of the post. But um, Amlo has kept number 23. I couldn't change that one. That's his number at this point. Anyway, Chelsea building out from the back. Chances for both teams within the first 20 minutes, although they are on the offensive here. Kai Havertz with it in the wide areas. Calafiori, can he stand up his man? He forces them to go inside to Rodrigo, who kicks it, oh my word. Toby has made an absolute meal of that. And then Smith's kicked it straight at him. We have just been let off the hook big time. That was not nice. That was not the kind of opportunity I want to see going against us. That was very, very lucky and not a lot else. Anyway, Ruiz for them. To Mason Mount, still playing for this Chelsea team, still a fawn on my side. Now with Rodrigo, the young Brazilian who's going to tuck it away there. And, I mean, 
it's not it's not the ideal start because they have had more chances than us and they finally taken one. I was about to say first goal of the season for him, Jack. It's the first game of the season. This could be everyone's first goal. Just a court. I think the offside track didn't quite work there. I think Rodgina was just playing Rodrigo on side, sadly for us. But it was very, very close to be fair. It wasn't like a terrible offside trap attempt. Anyway, we've shouted to man more at the players. Let's see if we can you know, get our head back on now. Can we relax into this game? We can't afford you know, to get stunned or to, I guess, panic. We need to stay on the front foot here. And we're going to do that with Smith. Playing the Mazala role in that wider right centre mid position. Ball all the way back to Tamori. Now lumped forward to Rodrigo. Calafiori is going to gobble that up. But no, I'm picking up this new system. It's not changed very much in reality. It's just a slight shift in terms of positioning. I'd be interested to know how you would set up Rickett, Smith and Lind. Because I feel like all three are like our starting sentiments. They're all good enough. I'm just not sure how they all fit together. As I said, it is Skulls, Lampard and Gerrard. Mark II, Electric Boogaloo. Chelsea in this game are absolutely killing us right now. We have not been good in this half. A second shout of demand more. We've edged out possession. We've had more passes completed, but it's not resulted in any real meaningful chances. And while Smith bringing it forward for them, takes it round his man. He is quick, isn't he? That Smith kid. He hits it. Toby should save that. If he doesn't save that, I'm not. I'm not happy at all. But he's he's got his paws to it. He's clutch hold of it, and it means that at the break, it is going to be one nil. And. It's been a very even game. We've edged out possession. I mean, they've had slightly more shots, but, you know, the way that we play, we do like to be slightly more methodical, I feel like. Maybe I need to get the players whipping some early balls into the box. Anyway, Navio to Lind. Now with Amlo. Erk cutting inside. Where can he go? Oh, my word. Almost into the top corner is the answer. I thought he might take it closer to goal, but found an inch of space at the edge of the box. Goes to the long shot. Goes, sadly for us, just over the bar. Looking at this game, Lind has not had a good game, which does not fill me with confidence. I think we'll bring in Dr. Medge to play deep line playmaker. He can definitely do a job for us there. Um, elsewhere at right back, Rogine has been poor, but I feel like I have to show blind faith with him. Um, I'm wondering what else I want to do. You know what? I don't feel like I want to make another change just yet. We'll bring in Dr. Medge for Lind, get some fresh legs in the midfield, but... It's a close game. It's an even game. There's been even fewer chances in the second half. And at this point, I think we've got to push the tempo up a little bit. Maybe hit some earlier crosses. Out of possession. I, I want us pressing now. I want us pressing. I want us marking tightly. I want us to force over turnovers if we can. Ten minutes left. I mean, we'll go attacking. Roll the dice a little bit. Nothing is happening. Right, Steve Secker, I've left it late, mate, but this is your time to come on and be a hero. Elsewhere, Van Dyke's not had the, a debut to kind of remember. And Califiori has taken a knock, so we'll bring in Matty at left back. Get some fresh legs on the pitch. But this game, I mean, it's not a classic. It's not been full of cham chances, and it's definitely not a debut to remember for, for a few of the players out there. Do I want to watch this? I'm, I'm going into the tunnel, everyone. I'm going into the tunnel. I, I, look, lads, we've not been good enough. We're not watching them lift the trophy. It is, it's upsetting me too much. But it finishes Chelsea 1, Forest 0. Van Dijk made a debut. Not a debut to remember. And Calafiori's now out for four weeks. It's not ideal. What it does mean is that Matty, welcome, welcome to the first team, my friend. You've never played left back on a consistent basis. You will be in the upcoming games because I do value him, I think, slightly more than Hayden Roberts. There's not a world of difference between them, to be fair. Um, I mean, if you were to look at the polygon, yeah, I mean, you'd be splitting hairs, really. But I do just like the mental and, and the technical edge that I suppose that Matty has in our favour. Anyway, our league season starts very, very soon. When does it start? It starts in five blooming days. That's not a long time. It's Arsenal as well. As I said, next episode, I think we'll do a triple header. I'm still going to be looking at centre-back options to sign. I think Paulo Silva might be the one I go for. Um, in terms of who they'd be replacing, I feel like it would be a bit of competition for Navio and Peter Shack. Um, I mean, you can see here... Um, Kind of silver compared with Navio, who is also inconsistent. Not as good technically, but very good in the air, very good defensively. Something that I don't want to say we lack, but we don't have a standout defensive defender. 
if that makes any sense. Either way, I'm going to end things there. Disappointing kind of start to the year. Hopefully, we're going to bounce back. If there's a game to lose against Chelsea, it's probably that one. I would love to know your thoughts on our transfer dealings this year, on the ins, the outs, the possible signings. Um, I'm sure there is going to be a few people disappointed that I've let Samake and Akamash go, but let's be honest, £74 million was just silly money, and I really couldn't afford to turn that down. Anyway, guys, that is all from me today. Hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure to drop a like on it, and I will see you guys again tomorrow. It is me, Jack, and I'm out.